Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to start uh, this morning with a show of hands. Raise your hand if you are busy. That's about what I thought. All right, now try this. Raise your hand if your busy looks and feels like this. The words, if you can't read them before you raise your hand, the words, if you can't read them, are me trying to excel in my career, maintain a social life, drink enough water, exercise, text everyone back, stay sane, survive, and be happy. Raise your hand if, that's, if your busy looks a little bit like that, maybe. Now, I know all of those things don't apply to everyone, okay? But take out the ones that don't apply and put in the ones that do apply, And I wonder how accurate this wonderful picture of Cruella de Vil cruising down the street, uh, how accurate that is to each of our lives. Busyness. Busyness. That word has become like a swear word to me. If you've heard me say it about myself, as in, I am very busy... You have heard a momentary lapse in judgment on my part. I do not use the word busy. I hate it. Dare I say, hate it. I don't like the word busy. In fact, if you have said to me over the last several months here at Painesville Lutheran, I know you're busy, Pastor Adam. I have likely resisted your gracious response to something that I've screwed up along the way. I don't like it as an excuse. I don't like it as a descriptor. I don't like the word busy. Because most of the people, not most of them, but a lot of the people who share this calling with me, that is being a pastor, a lot of my colleagues in this calling wear busyness like a badge of honor. They wear it proudly, as probably as proudly as and with as much esteem as they wear their clergy collars around their necks. If we're not busy in this role we have, what are we worth? If we're not busy, we must be doing this job wrong. And that kind of thought process, that kind of that kind of uh, embracing of busyness, it's not untrue in this line of work or really any other line of work that we attach a lot of worth to what we do. In the world of busyness, this is the key driving force, that we attach a lot of worth to what we do. Busyness is what we call performancism. And performancism tells us that there is no difference between what we do and who we are. Performancism, as David Zoll writes, holds that if you are not doing enough or doing enough well, you are not enough. Enough. There is that word. This is is the word and the place that we will dwell for the next six to seven weeks as we unpack this idea of something that David Zoll calls seculosity. And at the core of seculosity is something embedded in each of our human DNA. The longing for some sort of righteousness or enoughness. Seculosity, what is that? That's a goofy word. It probably sounds like a word you've maybe heard at some point in your life, but uh, maybe don't know it exactly. That's because it's a combination of two words you have definitely heard, secular and religiosity, or religion. In his book of the, by the same name, Seculosity, uh, David Zoll defines this uh, kind of made-up word as a catch-all for religiosity that's directed horizontally rather than vertically, toward earthly rather than heavenly objects. So this religiosity that we 
each of us has embedded in our human DNA is going towards the things of this earth rather than vertically toward God. He argues that even though we have seen a decline in participation with capital R religion, this thing we're doing in this space, that we are seldom not in church, even if we aren't in church. Other things in our lives are getting this small r religion. That is those things that we lean on to tell us that we're okay, that our lives matter. The ladders that we spend our time and our days climbing toward a dream of wholeness. <clears throat> These things that are not just a controlling story of our lives, but a justifying story of our lives. Our religion, he writes, is that which we rely on not just for meaning or hope, but enoughness. And there's that word again. Enough. It's everywhere. You know this. It's everywhere in our lives. It's attached to every single thing that we do. Look at this collection of enoughs that he lists in this book, Seculosity. Successful enough, happy enough, thin enough, wealthy enough, influential enough, desired enough, charitable enough, woke enough, good enough. Oh. If we reach some level of enough, then we, ourselves, are enough. And this is why I can't stand busyness. And why many of us can't physically stand it either. We can't keep up. We're raging down the street like Cruella de Vil trying to keep ourselves busy. Because if we're not busy, then we're not doing enough. And if we're not doing enough, then we might not be we might not actually be enough, and we have to be enough. Our life has to be enough. We have to get there, because if we don't, what is this all worth? What are we worth? And this kind of pursuit, this tireless, endless chasing of enoughness, we think we, we will know when we see it, it is killing us. It is killing us. In the figurative sense, we are all so stinking tired and worn out and burdened and anxious and lonely, whether busy describes you or not. We are all in this place. It is life sucking to keep giving ourselves over to the pursuit of righteousness. It takes everything from us. And in the literal sense, exhaustion, high blood pressure, heart disease, and suicide are literally cutting our lives shorter. We are on a train that is hard, if not impossible, to stop because it is ingrained in who we are in our humanity. We are wired as people to long for righteousness and we will give this longing to anything that can offer us some sense of feeling as if we are on the right track. We give it to busyness, food, politics, relationships, parenting, whatever it is. And sometimes what it is, is this thing that we do here. We busy ourselves all the time as people of faith with holiness and spirituality in search of justification within this kind of community in the same way as that which we call secular. The same kind of inability to keep up, the same kind of exhaustion run rampant in this realm as well as it does out in that world. And that is the problem. Not the things themselves, of course. None of what Zal talks about in his book or the things that we will talk about over the course of, the, of Lent are inherently bad. 
Most of them are actually really good. But they are a problem, at least the way that we engage them right now in this world. Because we turn to and we lean on all of these things for enoughness. They become our path to a moving target of salvation. We believe that we can do it if we just do enough. Our framework in the church is based heavily on the writings, the theological writings of Paul. All throughout his letters are foundational explanations of what God has done in Jesus Christ. What God has done for us in Jesus Christ. And while it may appear at times in Paul's writings that he's giving us list upon list of things we need to do and things we need to believe to receive the promised gift of grace from Je- in Jesus Christ, over and over again, Paul makes it clear that this gift has no bearing on us at all beyond what is given to us already by God. He must have been writing to people just like us who thought they needed to prove their enoughness through their doing. Exhausted, burdened people killing themselves just like us who needed to hear those words, God who is rich in mercy out of the great love with which he loved us even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Anxious, lonely souls like us in need of the truth. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Not by your own doing. It is the gift of God. We, in so many destructive ways, we have determined, each of us, that we are not enough. We give everything that we have and everything that we are to our performance and our self-justifying in order to fulfill our longing for righteousness and enoughness. It has become such an overwhelming force that it is damaging our very lives. And all the while, we have a God who in Christ Jesus has freed us from this burden we carry into each and every day of our lives. A God who has put to death our performancism, our longing, our striving, our pursuit, and has raised up something new, something that actually matters. Grace. Unearned. Uncoerced overwhelming, abundant, life-giving grace. Enoughness. We are busy. We are a lot of different things. Some are good. Some are not so good. But they do not make us who we are. We are something already through Jesus Christ embodying the truth that we will repeat over and over again. Nothing that needs to be done hasn't already been done. And so we believe and we hope in these truths that have already been done. Things that have already been accomplished. We are loved. By grace, we are saved. We are made for something good. In short, we are enough. And we are not dead. But instead, we are alive together with Christ. We are enough. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, 
We give you thanks for the gift that you have accomplished in Christ Jesus. Overwhelming and abundant grace for your people. We pray that in our busyness and in all of the ways that this life takes our time and our energy, in all the ways that we give ourselves over to this pursuit of enoughness, that you would instead turn us to you and help us to see that what, has, what we need, righteousness and salvation and grace, has already been accomplished. And we may turn to you and receive that gift, that free gift, and may bring it out into the world. Help us to know, O God, that we are enough. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.